Hi, everyone. This is Anna McCoy. I am with Anna McCoy Global Ventures. I want to welcome you uh, to this uh, session of Horasis 2021, Fostering Shared Humanity. This particular session is about encouraging the female executive. And uh, we would just want to take a moment to thank Frank and all those who put this together to bring such amazing and brilliant minds together. I'm super excited about sharing this stage with some amazing uh, female executives. And um, hopefully you're, you'll be excited about what you hear and some of the information uh, that we'll be sharing. And so today on this panel, we have um, Natalia Blockina, co-founder of Writer Ventures, Inc. Uh, from the USA. She'll be joining us. Deborah Wayne, Chief Executive Officer, Kingdom Investment and Development from the U.S. as well. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Goldby, Chief Executive Officer of Achievement Club from Canada. And Prashe Kale, Director of the Depository, Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. What we'll be talking about today, and welcome, welcome. What we'll be talking about today uh, is encouraging the female executive. Despite comprising 50% of the workforce, women contribute less than men to the global GDP, and women are underrepresented in all top jobs. So how can we create a meritocratic, fair, respectful, and balanced executive workplace? More female leaders might foster a sharing community, but all must join in this quest, men and women. So we'll be answering some of these questions today, but I'm super excited uh, about our panel today. And so coming up first, what I want to do is we're going to take a few minutes, each of us, uh, to just talk a few minutes about what's important to us and how we can add to this conversation. So I want to thank those who are coming into the room uh, feel free to add any questions or comments uh, in the comment uh, section and feel free to respond if, as you hear things that are uh, interesting to you or maybe an aha and just give us a clap, give us a shout, you know, just come on, join the conversation. If you want to join it, we also have the open mic. Uh, there will be an opportunity where I'll open up the uh, up this session for you to join us. So starting us off today, we're going to have Natalia, who is going to come uh, and share. And let me just share a little bit about who she is as the co-founder of Brighter Ventures. Um, she It's a woman-funded 501c3 nonprofit organization changing stereotypes of entrepreneurship and advancing women-led entrepreneurship through connecting women-led startups with resources they need to succeed like coaching, access to networks, access to capital, training, advocacy, and showcasing women-led startups. So she's going to be talking to us about achieving gender equality in venture capital, investing in female fund managers, and increasing capital flowing to women-led startups. So I'd like to welcome her to the stage. Uh, and then Following her, we will. Uh, I will introduce Deborah Wang, and we'll continue this discussion. But go ahead, Natalia. Welcome. Thank you, Anna. And uh, I'm so excited and honored to uh, be on the panel, and uh, looking forward to the great uh, with all the participants. Great to see you, ladies. Uh, we at uh, Bright Adventures are focusing on stereotypes of entrepreneurship and advancing women-led entrepreneurship because only a fraction of available capital is uh, going to women-led, women-founded startups. And uh, there are many reasons why it's happening, so I'm going to elaborate uh, on it during the, today's discussion. I would like to share my experience uh, as a female venture capitalist and uh, a member of a diverse uh, general partner team. I'm working a lot with women-led startups and I see in practice that best results come when people from different backgrounds, perspectives, points of view, different gender and age join their efforts to create measurable, positive impact and return. And I think that Achieving 
gender equality in venture capital through both investing in female fund managers and increasing capital flow into that startup will lead to better performance and pluralism of uh, cognitive diversity new ideas, which means innovation and social good. And during COVID year, uh, we see that female founders of the startups received just a small fraction, historically low again, despite the efforts taken in the previous few years. Uh, and uh, there are less new funds created. And uh, there are obviously less funds created with female funds. It's hard to raise venture funds for both men and it's hard to raise capital for all men and women. And it was even harder during the pandemic year because of the lockdowns and the lack of offline meetings because traditionally uh, mm -hmm. fundraising uh, requires in-person meetings. Mm -hmm. and the importance of network and my question is now when uh, we are getting back to offline meetings when we see the uh, value and deficiency of the blended meetings will uh, the trend get better will there be more money coming the women-led startups and male fund managers and I think that it won't happened just because the borders are opening and the travels are resuming. I think it requires the coordinated, targeted effort and the networking and access uh, to connections are very, very important. And it, it's not only about the network of women, but also men. Uh, we need male allies to break down the barriers. And we know that you know, uh, men occupy the majority of positions of power in entrepreneur and both and and in this and actually there are uh, many male counterparts uh, when we work as venture capital with corporations so we need to create more abilities for uh, women in venture world to get access to the networks uh, Actually, venture capital com compared to other asset classes are not that bad in promoting diversity. A lot of work was already done and North America leads the way. And there is one fifth of venture capital employees who are female. And there, there is the largest proportion of women in senior roles. But again, it's, it's a low base effect. And mm -hmm. the uh, continuous and sustainable effort. So why it is important to have more women in such a male-dominated industry as uh, venture capital industry? Uh, first, women are actually looking for more sustainable solutions and they do care about social impact. Uh, and it's, it, it's, uh, it's known that um, when the solution is taken by a group, those solution will, solutions will address the needs of the group that found those solutions, right? So if we have more inclusive group, the solution will be more inclusive and address the needs of different groups. And also there is, uh, there is a need to overcome uh, the issues uh, which are driven by, uh, caring about tradition, right? So women executives, they care less about tradition and they are more open to challenging the status quo, which is also is a very skill required in venture industry, uh, in venture capital industry. So this kind of behavior driven by women, which women uh, executives, women startup founders can bring to the table uh, is, likely to increase the receptiveness to change, uh, from the whole group 
and it could trigger more open-mindedness in how we pick innovations and uh, how we measure the outcome, both the, the return and the impact and uh, the effect for the social good. So I think that uh, the convergence uh, converges between the industries, between corporates and venture industry is getting more and more important because it's creating more chances for women and men of different ages to try themselves in different roles. And uh, we need to ensure that uh, we continue creating the favorable conditions uh, mm -hmm. to those who are not included yet uh, to try themselves in the diverse teams and in the diverse environments. Okay, thank well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have Deborah who will uh, share with us. Um, Deborah is the Chief Executive Officer of Kingdom Investment and Development in the USA. Uh, she is a serial entrepreneur with 20 years experience in founding companies in such roles as executive corporate management, corporate legal, M&A, and IPOs. Among her achievements, she has started a few successful high-tech companies. She's raised hundreds of millions for her companies and made sizable returns for shareholders. She is a business visionary who raises the bar higher and strives for great, uh, greater achievements. Along with great achievements, Ms. Wang is extremely humble, uh, religious, and has dedicated herself to helping others. So welcome, Deborah. Hi, thank you, okay. and hi, hi, everyone. So. Hi, so uh, today I want to talk about, uh, you know, as we all know, women are underrepresented at all top job. You know, that's the topic. <laughs> okay, so uh, so uh, in order to order to alter the current entrenched in the business model, um, the following initiative will make a significant difference. To the number one setting goal for hiring and promoting women. To so setting goal for hiring and pro promoting women uh, is very important because the pre the goal the preset goal will provide as a measurement to make sure the organization is making improvement and the, to and make progress in both hiring and promoting women. So the preset goal should be set for the percentage of women to be promoted to both middle and top management level. The preset goal should open open should be set for the percentage of women in the workforce. For example, year, year number one, the percentage of work, women in the workforce to be set at 20%, and the year num number three, the percentage to be set at 25%. So the corporate, the organization can make sure, are they moving toward the direction of uh, you know getting to a higher percentage in hiring and promoting women? And uh, number two, partnering with the education institution to encourage women to study in area that will yield good high paying job. This can be done, for example, engineering program to partner with engineering firm and to encourage women to study in the engineering program and have an internship with the engineering firm. The internship can lead to a permanent job after the graduation. Number three, providing place of time for childcare Elder care, maternity leave, and uh, housekeeping. As we all know, women are historically disadvantaged with the burden of child care. So the first time should be provided for women for them to be able to come in later and also work later or can work from home. The, the first time will allow women to balance the historical burden of child care and the care for the elder parents. Number four. Mentoring program. Mentoring program can be done by older or more experienced worker to help younger or new workers to learn their job and to get to learn the people and work with people at the workplace. Mentoring program has been proven to be a very useful mechanism in both cooperation and educational institution to help women in the workplace. Number five. To foster an inclusive and respectful culture, to foster an inclusive and respectful culture in workplace, 
in the human resource will play a very important role to provide training to help women um, to and to have to have the place to have a inclusive and respectful culture to help women without discrimination and sexual harassment. A workplace with the inclusive and respectful culture will attract and keep women employees. Number six, company training program. Women have been very passive to try to ask for raise and try to ask for, for themselves and also to network with people in the industry. So the company program should be provided to teach women how to advocate for themselves, how to ask for raise, and to network with people in the industry. Because these are important skills to have in order to be promoted to the top job. And finally, women learning to negotiate for themselves. Historically, women have been very passive, not active to negotiate for themselves. So company training programs should be provided to teach women how to negotiate for themselves. Also, the mentors should also try to teach women the skill of how to negotiate for themselves. The share of women in senior role globally is increasingly incrementally. However, as we all know, no country are women equal. In fact, recent data has projected it will take 170 years to achieve global gender equality. Why should we OK about this? $12 trillion will be added to global GDP by 2025. So it's very important for all sectors globally to work together to close the gap. This will make our world a richer and better place for everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Thank you all. Thank our audience who's listening. Our next speaker is going to be Sarah uh, Goby. She's the Chief Executive Officer of Achievement Club. Sarah, uh, which is a community coaching initiative centered around providing connection and accountability to empower a global community of achievers to reach their highest potential through personal development principles. She is a certified transformational coach, international speaker, and facilitator. Um, she will be talking to us about good mentorship, sponsorship, and the concept of reverse mentorship as a way to create a pipeline of female leadership potential to actively combat systemic biases, the glass cliff, and other challenges faced by female leaders in the current ecosystem. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> I'm... Of course, as a coach, most of my experience and, and my passion is on the side of mentorship and coaching and really connecting women with these tools and how they can grow their career with these tools. I'll leave the talk of the financial problems to the experts we have on this panel because y'all are much more knowledgeable than I am on those subjects. But um, something that really got me started on this journey, especially in the mentorship department, was really having good mentors made or braid make <laughs> made or broke my career in a previous life. So I am classically trained as an environmental consultant and I ended up leaving that industry. I would be considered a member of the leaky pipeline, if you will, the concept of women joining STEM careers to drop out exponentially and a direct reason for that happening was terrible mentorship. <laughs> yeah. um, in my experience, it was everything yeah. from I had older women mentors telling me I had to wear baggier clothes and not associate with anyone after work. So actively cut myself off from networks, actively cut myself off from support systems to male mentors actively sexually harassing me and exploiting their power dynamics in order to and this is I'm not an exception, I'm much closer to the rule in these experiences. And so I ended up pivoting, using my skills learned through management, through leadership, pivoting into coaching because my I had solid mentorship in these areas. I had solid opportunities in these areas and my skills were much more valued. I faced much less systemic barriers than I did in the traditional agriculture, um, oil and gas sectors, utility sectors that I was working in. And so in my mind, as we talk about this, we have all this data, we have all these points that a lot of our speakers have already touched on that 
when we have more women, when we have more people of color in the decision making rooms, in the C-suites as executives, we have a greater focus on innovation throughout the company, which means we're more flexible, which means we handle things like global pandemics better. We have more inclusive outlook and we actually have increased profitability and sustainability over time in all areas when we take these initiatives. And so rather than spout a bunch of data because it's out there, do a quick Google. If you don't already believe in this, you probably wouldn't be watching this panel. But if you are trying to, we're sitting at in North America, the statistics run between four and 6% usually in the C-suite of women. Mm -hmm. And even in areas where we're seeing one to one hiring ratios at kind of the bottom, we're seeing the women drop off all over the place, especially during COVID. We saw this, right, because as the traditional caretakers, women dropped out of the workforce. And we're also going to see a huge impact as we come back from COVID. Women and parents are going to be the ones most affected by the return to work. And so if you truly care about this, if we want to see more inclusion, if we want to see more sustainability, if we want to leverage the advantages to our companies, to our industries, that increasing women leadership gives us, the first question is, are you actively watching for promising female leadership, for promising people of color within your organization? Are you watching for these people? And then are you taking it upon yourselves as the existing leadership, not leaving it to the other women leaders to be inspiring and take on the job themselves, but coming in yourself and acting as both a mentor and a sponsor. And when I say mentorship, I don't mean hand them a bunch of advice that tells them to work harder or to wear bag your clothing or whatever that is. Are you listening to what they're experiencing? Are you connecting them with the networks that you have, with the opportunities that you have? Are you saying their names in rooms where opportunities are had? Are you pushing them toward taking riskier moves to get more visibility, to become more conflict resolution, which is where we start to see that glass cliff phenomenon, the idea that women and people of color often get promoted into riskier situations, which could be career enders instead of career beginners. Are you encouraging them to take those high risk moves or are you encouraging them for promotions in all ways? Are you connecting them? Are you putting their names forward for promotions in all ways? Or are you just giving advice and expecting them to close the gap? That's the first step in effective mentorship. It's both listening and connecting them with opportunities. It's both looking at where they're at and helping them close the gaps. Instead of just expecting them to be like you, be more like you, mm -hmm. here's how I did it, so here's how you have to do it. That's where the concept of reverse mentorship comes in. And there's some brilliant information out there from a woman named Patrice Gordon, if you want to follow up on this concept. I know we have a short time here, so I don't want to kind of spout off at you. But reverse mentorship is the idea of having a more junior person actively mentoring the senior member, the one who would normally be considered the mentor in the relationship, to help them expand their views, to help them expand are you considering these diverse impacts, the impacts on the women, the impacts on the people of color in your decision making? Do you have any reference of these perspectives? Are you aware of the barrier they face, of the opinions they have, of the ideas that they're bringing forth in the world? Or are you just siloed <laughs> in the same networks, in the same entrenched traditional values, as Deborah was saying, um, and perpetuating the same things? And so reverse mentorship, again, goes back to that listening. And it is a skill and it is something that we really have to work to respect the dynamic when we're in that. It's not a you, you shut your mouth and you listen. You don't talk over anyone. We are looking to connect with people outside, no direct reports. So they have more freedom to tell you exactly what's going on without fear of repercussion. Um, and kind of creating that safe dynamic and safe space, if you will. I know there's a lot of talk of, mm. and dismissive talk of safe spaces, but if we can go to an offsite place, if we can even have somebody else's office, something that kind of almost levels the playing field a bit where the junior employee can feel free to bring their opinions, can feel free to really impart wisdom upon the more senior executive in order to expand their own knowledge of what's going on. 
and without the fear of repercussion, without the fear of of the dynamic flipping without them being able to control it and really helps that sort of dynamic really helps us as women really helps those who struggle to get into the higher echelons of the executive office, if you will, advocate for ourselves. It's a practicing of that advocacy. It's a practicing of that having your opinion listened to and valued, which is often dismissed. And then as well, it helps us create those as we're making the decisions, as we're looking at creating the flexible work hours, as Deborah was saying, as we're looking at the modified schedules, equal pay, access to daycare, I know in the US maternity leave is a big one as well. Mm-hmm. Are you making those decisions having listened to the women, the people of color within your organization? Or are you making those decisions based on the profit or what's been traditionally done? Because what we're coming into, coming back from COVID, is if you're demanding everyone come back to the workplace, it's the women and the parents who are going to suffer most from that. And if you're implementing a hybrid workplace, how are you making sure that the people who are working from home are not being disconnected from the opportunities that exist because they're not as visible? How are you making sure that these people are really able to participate and be valued in the workplace, not just because they can show up work eight hours a week and do it like you do, the traditional sense, but in that they can balance their lives and their work, still show up, produce incredible results versus putting in face time and having to earn it through the way you did it 20 years ago because things are shifting. So are you creating a flexible space? Are you listening? Are you providing good mentorship? And are you transparent around your DEI goals um, and increasing the visibility around female executives to help them and to provide an example of sorts without having to put the burden on them to further other themselves by championing women all the time and making the incumbent executives more uncomfortable with their presence. So, And may I just add to what Sarah said, that I I think it's important to believe in championing diversity and inclusion. Yes. Yeah. Both as men and a female leader yourself are helping uh, the next generations to join the executive teams and the boards. Exactly. Yes. It's effectively a putting a, putting your money and effort where your mouth is, because we've had so many incredible corporations come out with these very, very good lofty goals for DEI. But what mm-hmm. are you doing? Wow. Right. Here's some of the actions that we can be taking that are proven through studies, through all of these avenues to work. Are you taking these actions? So thank wow. you so much. Well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. We only have a few more minutes, so we may not be able to, to hop to questions. So I want to make sure we give uh, Prashea Kale an opportunity, who is the Director of Diverse Talent Management and Advancement at DDCC. She manages the execution of strategic initiatives, department operations, and senior management report- reporting. She's a strategist and gifted conversationalist. She has helped stakeholders navigate corporate governance, complexities, develop critical partnerships, and manage change associated with highly complex efforts. So welcome, Prashea. Thank you, and morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, Actually, I think the ladies before me, highly accomplished, just did a phenomenal job setting it up. I don't think I have to sort of regurgitate everything they said. We know what the problem is, and I've always said it before, you have enough data. There's enough, you know, proof out there. There's enough problems out there and there's enough solutions out there. I think it's more about how well you're executing against them, right? And a, f- and a few points I would like to punch that I think, um, you know, everybody sort of touched upon was the role that men play in this um, in this sort of equation, right? We should have some men on this panelist. Every day shouldn't be the women talking about this all the time. Um, that will be the day when I see all men talking about gender equality and then we're the ones who are watching this. Um, right. This is us promoting it. So for me, that'll be when I know there's been some significant shift or you know, we've hit critical mass. But um, that is tremendously important because it also sort of um, flows into the societal concept of gender equality. Right. We're talking about this in our corporate work environments. We talk about this in entrepreneurship. We talk about this in our corporate careers. Uh, when once you leave the door, whatever that door might be, your bedroom or your office, you know, 
um, it's it's it doesn't matter when I go out. My image as a woman is still you know expected to be to fit a certain mold, right? Um, mm-hmm. Women traditionally, women you know non traditionally, younger women, older women, we're all sort of trying to fit a certain mold, be it in the office or be it in the um, you know at home. We're constantly trying to strike this balance if I may and there is no balance right we we go for a work-life balance it's truly integration but it's truly about what's an integrity for me as a woman as a human being um and that is missed somehow right if I am a CEO I go back home and still have to balance certain things or or um you know match this image of this woman who's supposed to be a certain way behave a certain way um achieve certain things and by a certain age, right? I mean, do I have to be married? Do I have to have kids? Do I have to have a certain level of success in life, right? Um, those things all clash and they're sort of, they add a baggage that we don't even realize we carry all the time, right? How many rocks are in your backpack? Um, so that's really, really important. And having men in the equation there to say, okay, how much of that burden are going? It's not just caregiving in, in, in childcare, like right? single women, how safe are you, right? Um, people assume that single women have easier lives. That's not true. It's, it's, it's very hard when you don't any, in, in any, in any situation, right? But um, physical safety, um, your personal responsibilities, personal roles, what your corporate jobs, what people perceive you as, right? So all of this sort of are very, very highly interconnected. Um, and, you know, I think this qualifies as a complex wicked problem as well. So, um, you know, and rightfully so it's earned its place in the SDG, but I think I'll just punch those points that, you know, all these ladies um, ladies made so, so eloquently. Well, thank you so much, Prashaya. Uh, so now uh, I, as the uh, host or, or the moderator of this, my name is Anna McCoy, for those that are just joining us. And I want to thank, thank our audience who've been with us throughout this uh, time. Um, and feel free to ask any questions. I am the CEO and founder of Anna McCoy Global Ventures. I am a serial entrepreneur. I have uh, created multiple multi-million dollar entities. I started my career almost 30 years ago uh, in real estate uh, event management and also healthcare. And so uh, today I work on investing in uh, different opportunities and future technologies uh, as well as educating women and empowering women traveling around the globe to uh, be a, a point of influence and also encouragement. I am also the author of a book of uh, three books. One behind me is Woman Act Now in a Formal Life. You see, she's a little different now, <laughs> but um, Woman Act Now is really about encouraging women to achieve their dreams and visions. And so I think the part that I want to help uh, just add to this conversation, and I want to thank all of our panelists and the great work that you have done, is uh, when I think about this whole idea of encouraging the female executive or entrepreneur, and even in, within this panel, we've had discussions before today. Uh, some of the things that we talk about, uh, I want to encourage you as a as a woman. I have a bit of a different uh, viewpoint in many areas when I think about my journey as both an African American woman as well as uh, a woman in a male dominated, uh, mostly in a male dominated uh, industry of real estate development, uh, of working in minority communities, trying to change our environment and bring quality products and services to low and moderate income communities. One of the things that I would say to you, and I'm an, I am a, um, what do you call it? Just a, uh, I'm a coach. I'm an encourager. And in this part of my life, I'm all about, you know, bringing good to the world. So I would say this as women, as those who will listen to the, to this and those that are hearing it now, I would say one of the things that have been most helpful to me as a female uh, entrepreneur as well as executive working in these environments is never walking into the room as with this this chip of that I'm a woman. I'm the only yes. woman in the room, right? And I would say to you, um, I have seen it. I have seen it. You know, I walk in with the facts. I walk in with, um, you know, the confidence that I belong in this room. Uh, I think it was Shirley uh, Chisholm. She was one of the first uh, African-American 
uh, senators here in America. She says, listen, if there's no chair for you, bring your own folding chair yep. to the room. And I think if, as women, we have to, we do talk a lot about the challenges that we face, uh, the hurdles that we face, uh, the lack of confidence or the fear of failure. Everybody's got it. Okay. Right. Male and female, everybody's got it. Let's just lay that on the table. Uh, there are certainly some systemic challenges, biases, things that we have to continue to overcome. And as we enter these spaces, we are the people who can be the, the change makers. You yeah. know, we are the women that can help the next women that change our perspective. But I would say to you that as we walk into these rooms, we walk in with the facts. We walk in with a confidence that we belong here. Um, we walk into the space knowing that we have an ability to shift this whole ecological makeup of what is happening in this room because we are in the room. And I have seen in my own in my own journey and having an experience to uh, be in environments, whether it's heads of states, whether it's CEOs of corporations, I do have this in my heart is that I have an, I have an answer. You hear what I'm saying? Because I know I belong here. And I think as we continue to pour this into our daughters and our granddaughters and tell them that, listen, there is a place for you in the world. And what I do know is what's for you is for you. You, don't, you can be unapologetic. And if you need to wear this shirt every single day until you get it, get the shirt on. Yeah. And so what I would say to us as uh, women and certainly hopefully as uh, women of multi-generational perspectives, look at this of uh, multicultural. We bring all of this to the table. I've had the privilege to travel to over 40 countries where I have have worked with women. And what I know to be true, we are more alike than we are different. Yes. We believe that we got it going on in the US or the UK or developed countries. But I'm gonna tell you this is when you get around the table, you get around the fire, you get around the circle, you realize that we are all facing the same challenges. And so I would encourage us, even as we are moving forward, one of the things that I know for sure that I am carrying is that questions are the currency of the future. I think as, as women, when we start to, you know, this whole coaching thing, you know, it's all about asking a well-formed question. And if yeah. we take that into the boardroom, if we take that into our teams, if we take it into places, you ask the right question at the right time. Why do you think Google is so rich? Why do you think it's so effective? Because it answers questions. And if we can kind of turn that on, like just turn it on in your own mind, in your own heart, that questions are the currency of the future. And if you are the woman sitting at the, at the table, you ask the right question because questions leads to thinking. Thinking leads to questions. Again, we start to ask a question that gives us an answer that then gives us the power to make the right choice then gives us an ability to take the right actions that will get the right results and the right outcomes. So I think if we start to shift a little bit of the way we think in this environment, whether we're the CEO, whether we're the entrepreneur, whether we're the one just coming in from college and begin to, to teach our, not only men and women, but teach whoever we are responsible for. It is a privilege to be a leader, in my opinion. It is a privilege to be a person that is looked upon as having knowledge and wisdom and experience. But I'm saying if you teach somebody you're working with that questions the currency of the future, that it's going to open doors, it's going to open opportunities, it's going to create the space for you when people look around and say, how did you get here? It doesn't matter because I asked the right question. And so I would also add that collaboration is not going anywhere. We have to collaborate with men and women. That's a, I mean, or however we look at this, the people on the earth, we've got to work together. It's a so given. as a result of that, you know, we have to have certain values, I think, that we can share in common. So when I see you, Sarah, when I see you, Deborah, in a space, I know that we share these common values. So that's my offering to you today is be a woman who knows that if you ask that right question, the whole world opens up, the whole yeah. opportunities open up for you. And so I think if we start to teach each other how to think uh, more effectively through questions, 
we can really change something and do something remarkable. Yeah. Not the only answer, but it certainly has helped me in my career. And I would pass that on to you. So uh, please just jump in there. We have a few more uh, minutes. If you want to ask a question or share something, let's, let's drop it. Drop that. Gym. Hang on. Just, just in, just, you know, sort of um, elaborating what you said, I tell my coaches quite a bit, you know, women, I coach entrepreneurs, yes. I coach um, professionals as well, but I do say, you know, bring your chair, but then if that table is not right for you, be willing to change the table, right? You don't exactly. have to be stuck where you are. Just pick up and go. Like you have a place, you, there are avenues out there now, right? I mean, we do say, yes, it's going to take a long time. There has been some progress, but definitely, you know, bring your chair, set up your table or change your table, right? It's, it's That's all right. There. Our, build your own table, build your mm -hmm. own table, right? Mm -hmm. So I think this is beautiful. Natalia. You want to, we have a couple of minutes. If we'll take 30 seconds just for some closing thoughts uh, that you want to share and inspire others, please do so. Sarah, you can come right after Natalia and then uh, Deborah and Prashea. If you have something you want to close with, you can do that as well. Thank you, Anna. I wanted to address a question we had. Uh, if we were okay. not, well, that's not looked positively, where is it's a positive quality in a man? And my response to that would be that. Try to understand why. And uh, it may be that there is something that creates that impression, right? And uh, it's again about open, being open minded and analyze, uh, not being afraid to ask questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Trying to understand how to find better ways to deal uh, with um, man and uh, how to behave to achieve goals. Mm -hmm. uh, my encouraging thought is that it's uh, never too late to try to experiment and uh, mm -hmm. if you have a negative experience and uh, you decided as a male executive that an environment or a job is not for you because of the previous condition, maybe there are other ways, like in Sarah's example, how you can build on your skills, how you can build on your education. You can try yourself in the environment. You go in the corporation, try yourself in a startup, join venture fund, build the skills there, uh, join social enterprise, become an impact entrepreneur, and vice mm -hmm. versa. That uh, you are lacking the skills of dealing with corporate customers, get into the corporation. Try uh, yourself in a row. And uh, it's all about experience, uh, lifelong learning. And, uh, I think that's exciting. And, uh, thank you, dear panelists, for sharing. You're welcome. All right, Sarah, we have two minutes, so 30 seconds. I just want to say thank you so much for having me here. It's been such a delight connecting with such passionate women. Um, to address the confrontational thing, I've been told in the exact same meeting that I was both oh too gosh. timid and too confrontational. Yes. So it's completely in the eye of, of the beholder. We know these biases exist. And if we go back to what Anna had said, if a, the more you can come in without that chip on your shoulder, ask the good questions and stay true to what you know to be right for you, um, the more we're able to move through these these labels of confrontational of mm -hmm. of whatever it is that's going to hold us back. So a bit of a cheese ball answer, I suppose, in some circles, but it's what's helped me most in my own life as I've pivoted through different careers to to kind of manage some of these challenges myself. So thank yeah. you so much for sharing the time and space. Yeah, Excellent. I would just add thank to you. that question, um, Sarah and Anna, is just, you know, sometimes you just have to detach yourself from that. It's really hard, but it takes mm -hmm. practice. That's right. but when you know, as, as Anna said, you're walking with the facts, you're walking it with information. It does not matter who thinks you're confrontational or even assertive or even rude or, you know, five letter words have been called. Right. So like you said, I've been called passive and assertive. Sometimes people have called me a pit bull. It doesn't matter. And sometimes they'll be like, OK, why don't you say something in that meeting? And I'm going, damn, if you do, damn, if you don't. So sometimes it's about what's on your plate and what's your agenda and what's in your heart that matters. Excellent. All right. Miss Deborah, if you'd like to share some last parting thoughts. 
Um, yeah, I, um, I think I think in my career, all I, I always been found my own company. So I always, I never like see myself to think about my I'm a war, I'm a woman and I put myself mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. head of, you know a, a box. So I think that's very important. So like uh, Anna say, bring your own table, your chair. If this table did not fit or is full, go to find another table. Or just like we should create our own ballroom, you know. So I think yeah, that's yeah. Really, really important. Don't think about yeah. We are women and look full all those yes. uh yes. You know, the burden on our shoulder. Yeah. That's beautiful. And so my final my final thoughts uh are be assertive and not offensive. You know, a lot of times we are um we this confrontation, I'm so glad someone asked the question, is that confrontation is often uh it feels like it when we feel offended or we are offending someone yeah. else, right? We take it personally. And oftentimes we do have the chip where we have to, you know, you have, we have the.